Happy summer, Chase Oaks. Uh, so glad that you're here this weekend. I want to welcome uh, Chase Oaks Online, Espanol, Sloan Creek, Woodbridge. Uh, we are so glad that you are here. We are continuing a series called Living Large. And uh, this series is looking at the book of Philippians. And uh, Paul wrote a letter to a church in Philippi. And if you didn't get a chance to listen to week one, I encourage each and every one of you to go back and listen to uh, week one. Blake did a fantastic job giving some background um, about uh, the book of Philippians. And today I get chapter two. Now, during this series, what we want you to do is not just expect us to uh, give it all to you uh, on here on, on the weekend. We actually want you to go home and study it for yourselves as well. So I'm going to cover about half of chapter two. And then uh, this week, that's your homework. I want you to, uh, to study it further and ask God what it could possibly uh, be saying to you. And I want us to, to look at verse one of Philippians chapter two. It says this, so if there is any encouragement in Christ, any comfort from love, any participation in the spirit, any affection and sympathy, complete my joy being of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. Today I want to talk to you about how we can be more unified and be on the same page. Now, I realize that in America, we have different labels in, in different sections that divide us, that, that oftentimes there is a, a, a they and then there is an us. And, and I, I want to do a little bit of crowd participation right now, so don't be afraid to raise your hand. Uh, how many of you in the room are extroverts? Raise your hand. You don't have a problem raising your hand because you're an extrovert. That's great. Okay. How many of you are introverts? Okay. All right. Now uh, we're going to, we're going to move forward a little bit. How many of you are morning people? Okay, great. I heard a mmm. That means the other uh, rest of you, the night owls, how, where are you? You hate the rest of us. Okay. Cause on a Tuesday at six 30 and we're happy and you're like, why are you happy? You're like, cause it's Tuesday, you know, and you're, you're just excited. Um, I also believe that there um, in the room are um, dog people and cat people. Uh, how many of you are dog people? It's a dog church for sure. Uh, how many of you are cat people? It's not scary at all. We love you. Uh, how many of you are non-animal people like myself? I, uh, I, I'm afraid of animals. Um, I, think, I don't think animals are afraid of me. I was watering my grass a couple days ago and a gecko came running out. I ran like it was a T-Rex. You would have thought I was in Jurassic World in my backyard screaming. I'm like, what is it? All right. So... Uh, the, but there, that can divide us. Then we've got Coke people and Pepsi people. How many of you are Coke people? Raise your hand. How many of you are Pepsi people? Where are my Dr. Pepper people at? Okay. Uh, we're, we're all different types of people. Uh, and then here's where the real divide is going to be. We're going to test our spirituality right now. Where are my Walmart people at? People after my own heart. Savers. I love us. Okay. We're starting a small group for Walmart people in the lobby as soon as service is over. All right. We're all the target people that raise your hand. It's all the rich people. This is great. I want to be your friend. Apparently my wife's a rich person too. Okay. Every time she goes to target, I get a little bit nervous. The only place in the world you can get bananas and a kitchen table to go with it. Okay. Um, how many of you are iPhone users? And then the rest of you, just raise your hand, okay. You are the people that are causing our phones to have green bubbles and we don't like it, okay. Um, if I get a prayer request from somebody that doesn't have an iPhone and it's a green bubble, I won't pray for them, okay. I'm like, nope, you don't deserve to be prayed for. Just kidding, I'll pray for you, okay. Uh, now, this is a test. You may have seen this on the internet before, but I, I just wanted to do this little social experiment here live. Um, how many of you look at this dress on the screen and you see white and gold? Lord, I pray for all these blind eyes right now. <laughs> how many of you see that this dress is black and blue? Look at all these healed eyes. This is great. This is great. There are many things in our country, silly things like this, that can put us in different categories and different squares. But um, I think the things that really divide us on a deep level are things like politics. If I'm honest, in 2016, I saw that election create more division in the church than anything I've ever seen. 
I saw, regardless of, of what side of the aisle you find yourself on, I, I saw more volatile behavior amongst brothers and sisters in Christ in 2016 than I've ever seen. And if I'm honest, it makes me really nervous for 2020. Not because of who's going to continue to be president or who's going to step into presidency, but because of what it might do to us. It scares me sometimes. I, when I look at what's going on in our country and, and issues of ethnicity and how we treat one another, man, these are things that can really divide us. These are things that can put us on different sides of the aisle, not only just ethnicity, but also sexuality. Depending on how you grew up, depending on what you were taught, depending on what the Bible says, the Bible says, the Bible says, depending on, on how you see the world, you can find yourself treating other people that don't believe what you believe in a different way, sometimes in a harmful way. And all of a sudden you find yourself in debates on the other side of the aisle from somebody else that simply doesn't believe what you believe and then you end up treating them differently. Now, something else that divides us is sometimes age. Sometimes there is a great divide between millennials and the baby boomers on ideas and how we spend money and what our economy should be like and how we view politics and how we view sexuality and how we view different things. And we can find ourselves separated. Not only that, I think one of the most divisive things that we can really find is the Internet. It's a great tool that can help a lot of people but it's also a tool that can hurt a lot of people. And I think we should use it wisely. What Paul is trying to say to a church in Philippi that is a very patriotic country, they were very, very loyal to their government in a time where it was not safe to be a Christian. I mean, it, like for being a Christian, you could get killed. There is lots of division. One guy's going, hey, man, I, I don't know, man. I don't know about this. Je Jesus was great. I, I like that, but I also like being alive. So I'm not sure if I want to follow him. And so, but they're going, no, that's the point. This is a radical thing. And they're going, but man, our government, man, they've been good to us and I'm not sure. And it was, a, it was a lots of patriotism going on. And they're going, man, what, 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 what are we going to do? And, and and Paul's going, hey, here's the deal. I realize the times are tough. I realize that things can feel like, for in our context, what can often feel like the divided states of America, that, that, hey, this is what I need you to do, church. This is what I need you to do, Christ follower. I need you to get on the same page. I need you to be unified. I need you to love each other. I need you to be together. And, and what I believe we're going to learn today, what we're going to see today, if you apply this, it changes everything. It changes everything, not just on a macro level of division, but also on the micro. And, and here's what I want you to understand. There are many things connecting us more than there are dividing us. Let me ask another set of questions, but this time I don't want you to raise your hand. How many of you grew up without a father? How many of you Grew up in a divorced home. How many of you are going through a divorce right now? Who showed up here today with a broken heart? Who lost a job? Who just got married? Who's madly in love? Who had sex in the last seven days? Who loves dancing? Who's, who's been bullied before? Well, here's what would happen as you would see different hands going up at each question is that you would very well see that there is a me too vote that you're in with somebody that may have voted differently than you. And what you have in common is this, is that you need a savior. We all do. At some point in time, we all find ourselves in the me too boat. And here's how Paul tells us how to do it. He says, do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourself. Here's the deal. You might not be a church person. You might not be a Bible person. You might read your Bible only on Sundays. Uh, regardless of, you might not even be, even if you're not a Christian, okay? If you decided to just live this verse, like you just picked one verse. You don't study Philippians chapter 2. You just pick one verse to live. If you decided just to live just this verse, 
You'd be a better husband, you'd be a better wife, you'd be a better manager, you'd be a better coworker, you'd be a better friend. Everybody would want to hang out with you if you just did this. It's the best way to lead. It's the best way to follow. I mean, if you just adopted this principle into your life, even if you're not a Christian, it's at minimum a really great idea for every relationship that matters to you. Because I promise you this, every relationship that went south in your life was because you did the opposite of this. Every single one of them. Now, let's break this down just a little bit. When you look at this and it says, do nothing from selfish ambition, the first thing you gotta go is, man, well, what's the difference between good ambition and selfish ambition? Because ambition in and of itself is not a bad thing. I'm a very ambitious person. I got a business degree. I love entrepreneurship. I love marketing. I love campaigns. I love branding. But there is something that can happen internally where you begin to trust your own abilities and your own ability to market and your own ability to promote for yourself more than you trust God. And for me, this is all about motives, because you have to realize something about each and every one of us. Every single one of us has a desire, propensity, and temptation to elevate ourselves, to advance ourselves, and to promote ourselves, especially when we feel undervalued. Whenever you feel undervalued, your greatest temptation will always be prove yourself. Oh, let me show you who I really am, and, and you have to be able to fight that, whatever that deal is, to go, all right, let me, let, me, let me show them. Paul's going, don't do anything from that because the results of that will not be good. And so here's, here's where it is for me. The right kind of ambition has less to do with what and a whole lot to do with who and why. So, so the what is the promoting, the marketing, the branding, the, the ambition. The what, the what is not the problem. The who and why is where we get in trouble. So I developed some rules uh, for social media posting just for myself, okay? And th this is how, not how I regulate social media, it's how I regulate my heart to make sure that what I'm doing, I'm doing the right thing for the right reason. Let me explain. Here are the rules. What are you posting? I ask the question, what are you posting? Is it a vacation spot? Is it a beach? You don't even like the beach that much, but you know the beach might make somebody else jealous, okay? Like, like you just, you're, it's your coffee, it's your brunch, it's a new pair of shoes, it's a car, it's a house, you just redid a kitchen, okay? Like, it's, it's a thing. That in and of itself, no problem. Here's where we get in trouble. Who are you posting it for? Who? Like, there is this proverbial they, the internet, these, these people, but, but like, usually when we post something, we have someone or some people in mind. And sometimes the, those people are people we went to middle school with that we don't even talk to anymore. But we want them to see, hey, I'm doing all right in life. Look at the vacation I can't afford. Look at, the, look at my highlight reel compared to your mundane life that you would have had if you would have chose to date me. Like, like, think about who it is that we're posting it for. And here's the, here's the issue. It's not that, that just because just you want them to see it, that that in and of itself is bad, but here's... We're talking about for four weeks living large. This is how you live small because when you're posting it for them, it's almost like you're living for them. And would you be willing to say that you're living for your middle school friend? You wouldn't, but some of you are. And you have to look at, okay, what am I posting and who am I posting it for? Which leads us to this. Why am I posting it? What, what, what's, what's the heart behind it? Like, what, what, what is it that I, I, I can post a verse right now. now. Now, the motive behind me posting a verse can either go, 
I hope that somebody looks at this verse that I posted and is encouraged today by it. Or I can post it to make you think I'm way more spiritual than I really am. To say, all right, oh yeah, Ryan was reading his Bible this morning, that's right. Um, I've noticed that on the Bible app, it's so funny. They ask you this new question when you start a new Bible reading plan. It says, do you want your friends to see your activity? And I'm going, whoa. Ooh, I don't know. Do, 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 I, I, I want my friend. I want to do a Bible plan with my friends because that would be cool. And I, I want them to. And, and, and there are some people that are friends with me on the Bible app that that quote unquote follow me. And so if I do the Bible plan, then maybe they will too. But then I just got some other friends that I do spiritual Olympics with, and, and they want to be more spiritual than me. And so I just think, oh, if they see that I'm doing a marriage Bible plan. And then all of a sudden, you just start thinking through all of this stuff from one simple question. Do you want your friends to see your activity? Sometimes I hit yes, sometimes I hit no. (laughs) It has nothing to do with the what. It has everything to do with the why. You want to do the right thing for the right reason. So um, I'm, I'm an author. And so by posting about my book, Ultimately, that means I could get more book sales. Um, I, I spent, um, uh, I was at a retreat last night with a bunch of authors, and we were talking about this very subject of going, why do you want to write a book? Do you want to write a book so you think you could get rich, or do you want to write a book because you think it's going to help a lot of people? The what is never the problem. It's the for who and for why, and when you start to go, all right, you know what? I'm an ambitious person. I've got a dream. I want to start a business. Okay, here's the deal. That's awesome. But if, you, if in your dream you are the only character in your dream, your dream is way too small. It's not that it's bad. It's just that it's too small. In your great dream for your life should involve helping as many people as you possibly can because you believe that if your dream comes true, it will elevate all of the people around you. But if, you're, if the goal of your dream is for you to get rich and for you to drive a Range Rover, it's not that it's that bad. It's just that this is what's going to happen. On your way to getting rich and to getting the car you want, you're going to end up hurting a lot of people because that was your ambition. And you will skirt around as many people to get what you want. But what Paul is is encouraging us to do is he says, man, you want to live a life that is unified, that benefits the community all around. Man, you should have dreams that help other people. And I found that the people that have dreams that help other people, all of a sudden other people want to help their dreams come true. Um, And here's here's what I want you to see. He also used the word conceit. Conceit um, is defined as a favorable opinion, especially excessive appreciation of one's own worth or virtue. Sometimes you just get to a place where you are so you-centric that it's going to be very, very hard for you to be unified. Ladies and gentlemen, this only works if we all do it. We all have to do it. There can't be one of us like, all right, I'm glad all of you guys are going to be unselfish. That allows room for me to be selfish. And and that means I get a lot of benefits from it because that means you're all going to be giving to me and I don't have to give to you. No, 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 no. There's there's something beautiful that happens when we all do it. And, And this is what I want you to know. Beware when you are putting more trust in your abilities than God's. And here's the line for you. And you've got to talk to God about this when you know it's selfish ambition. I know that there is an internal line that I cross when I am putting my trust in my own skills, talents, and abilities than trust in God. I know I have a problem when I spend more time promoting than I spend praying. And if I wake up and I'm willing to pray for an hour and then work out some marketing stuff for 30 minutes, then I know I've got a good balance. But if I don't talk to God about it at all and I'm just going, okay, what's the right move to make, then I know that in my heart I have found myself drifting from what God has really called me to be. For you, you've got to decide what your internal line is going to be to do the right thing 
for the right reason. And then he doesn't just say do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. He goes on to say this, let each of you look not only to his own interest, but also to the interest of others. And, and, and this is what I want you to see. If selfish ambition and looking out for your own interests create division, then becoming consumed with the promotion and advancement of others will create unity. Now, just think about this for a second. My hope and prayer for each and every person under the sound of my voice is that you would get a promotion, that you would get a boost in salary, that, that elevation and advancement would happen in your life in whatever field you find yourself in. Now, imagine if tomorrow morning you walk through your workplace doors and you tried to get somebody else promoted. Imagine it. Imagine if you walked in and the goal of your day is going, you know what, today is brag day. I'm bragging on everybody here that is doing a great job. Hey, y'all know Tom? Tom's crushing it, okay? Tom is the man. And listen, if somebody doesn't give him a raise, something's wrong. He's incredible. Did you know? Did you know? Did you know? Did you know? People are going to go, what is wrong with you? Do you, you got a crush on Tom? Like, what is going on? And it's like, like, what are you doing? You're going, man, I'm just looking out for the interest of other people. I'm consumed by it. Other people might think you're crazy, but you want to know who's not going to think you're crazy? Tom. <laughs> Tom's going to go, man, I want, pff, I want to be Bill's friend. Bill, Bill is plugging me nonstop. Well, well now Tom is going to go, well, man, what, <laughs> is there something I can do for Bill? It, it can be a chain reaction. Sometimes we just don't want to be the first one to start because no one's done anything for us. Sometimes we... We're waiting for somebody to do something kind for us before we're going to do something kind for, for somebody else. But can you imagine if you were consumed with going, man, how can I help everybody get better? How can I promote? How can I elevate? How can I uplift the spirits of every person around me? I, I get an opportunity to do um, some corporate speaking, and I love it because it usually starts with somebody that heard me speak in a church, and they work for a business, and they go, hey, can you come talk to our company? I said, man, I'd love to. That'd be great. And they go, well, well, you know you can't bring your Bible, right? I go, I'm okay. I, 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 think, I, I think I can do it. They go, well, well, well like, what are you going to talk about when you get there? <laughs> okay. Um, so have you heard of the golden rule in corporate America? The golden rule is uh, treat others as you want to be treated. I say, you know who said that first? Jesus. <laughs> That's Luke 6, 31. I said, I'm just going to call it the golden rule and talk about it for three hours. I go, you would do that? Watch me. Okay, I got this. Okay, so, so I go in and, I, and I'm talking to this corporation about uh, being a, a human being before you're a human doing. And, and I know that so many of the places that you work want you to do before you can be. But I, I think you've got to be a whole person to, to work at a top level. And so we talk about that and, and I talk about how you treat other people. And I'm like, man, did you know that you can be kind to your coworker? And some people are looking at me like, nope, I'm not going to do it. I'm like, we're going to do it right now. Okay. I want you to compliment the person on your right. And people are just so foreign, like, uh, like your, 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 your shirt is blue. That's nice. I mean, it's like, what do you do? Like, it's so foreign to them, but I'm just going to go, trust me, this is going to work because this is how I also want you to treat your customers and they're going to love you because you're treating them how you want to be treated. And I basically talk about Philippians chapter two and I never say the word Philippians chapter two. And I just go, man, isn't this a great idea? For everybody, and at the end of it, I do this big Q&A, and I let the whole corporation ask me a bunch of questions, and I was doing this in San Francisco, and this girl, she stands up, she's got tears in her eyes, and she says, I don't have a question, I have a statement. Thank you. You see, Ryan, I have grown up believing that the only way to get ahead in life, the only way to succeed is to step over somebody else. 
I grew up in a competitive, I went to a competitive school where, where I was taught business, like, hey, this is what you have to do, sales. You got to beat out the competition. It's a dog eat dog world. And so it's survival of the fittest. So you, you, so what, what do you got to do? And in the company I was at last time, they taught me that too, that this is the only way that I can get promoted. This is the only way that I'm going to get elevation. You got to be strong. And, and then you show up here today and you tell me that I can get ahead by being nice to people. Here's what's up about that. The person I've become because of what I've taught, what I've been taught, I don't like her that much. But this kind person, you've given me a new option for life. And I think I'd like her. So thank you for telling me that I have another option to be kind. Here's why I tell you that story. That's the world we live in. That's the divisive world we live in. And can you imagine if you decided to be the difference? Could you imagine if you decided to be a person in a world where no one tries to advance other people? That's absurd. What if you just decided to do it anyways? It might be the smallest adjustment you make that makes you the most like Jesus. And here's the interesting thing. Paul realized how crazy this concept was. Who's going to walk around advancing other people? Who? Listen, most of us live in a world where we've been taught Unless you take care of yourself, nobody else will. No one else is going to look out for you. You got to look out for yourself. Paul's going, listen, I know that might be hard for you humans to do, okay? So let me tell you who it was harder for. Jesus. Because he was God. And he decided to try on your skin for 33 years. And here's, here's what he says. He says, have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who though was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men. And being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death, on a cross. Therefore, God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. In other words, he's going... Do you realize what Jesus did for us? He, he practiced this the most. Now, Jesus has so many opportunities to just be God. He was 100% man and 100% God. And I know that's a concept that's hard to grasp, but, but Jesus illustrated moments where he, was, where he was both. He could weep over a friend that died, but he could also resurrect him from the grave. 100% God, 100% human. And, and the thing that I... I I, I just know that when Jesus was nailed to a cross, and, th and this had to be the greatest temptation Jesus ever experienced, when somebody shouts out, save yourself, when you know he could have. Let me tell you something. I couldn't have been Jesus, okay? Somebody, after you done spit on me, uh, 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 beat me to death, uh, nail me to a cross, you're going to yell out, save yourself. Listen, I'd have came up off the cross, okay? I'd have slapped every Roman soldier in the face. Every legion of, listen, it would have been a scene from 300. It, boom, I mean, it would have been nuts. You would too. There ain't no way you would have stayed up on that cross if you were God and had his power. Like, listen, God, they're they going to have to figure out their own sacrifice because I ain't playing with these dudes no more. You're not going to talk about my mama. You're not going to talk about my daddy. You're going to make fun of me. You're going to put this crown. No, no, no. Forget the crown. It's over. Okay, I'm shutting the whole thing down. <laughs> no, he didn't. In that moment when he could have, he just said, I'm going to stay. I'm not going to save myself. I'd rather save humanity. That's what he decided to do for you and for me. When you or I in the same position would have aborted mission in a second. I know it's hard to do this, but it was harder for Jesus. That's why he modeled it for us. And I know that there are things that you go through and people that have taken advantage of you. Jesus is going, I know I've been there. And I've made some tough decisions to humble myself 
and serve humanity anyways. Now, the beautiful thing about it is this, is when we all do it, this is what I believe happens. When we all count each other as more significant than ourselves, something amazing happens. We create a community where everyone is looked up to and no one is looked down upon. I mean, just imagine that. Imagine if at your job you were constantly counting others more significant than yourselves. Imagine if in your home you were constantly counting others more significant than yourself. I guarantee your marriage would change. I guarantee you're going to be a better parent. I guarantee you're going to be a better student because we're all so busy going, man, no, no, you, you are. I'm going to count you as more significant than me. I'm going to look out for your interests before I look out for mine. Doesn't mean I'm putting my interests all the way down. It just means I'm going to elevate yours and just say, man, can you imagine the amount of unity that we would experience if we all did this together? This is what I guarantee happens. Everybody's going to want to be this guy's friend. Everybody. Everybody's going to want to go out to eat with this guy. Everybody's going to want to be this guy's neighbor. Everybody's going to want to promote this guy. Everybody's going to want to invite this guy to his wedding. Everybody is, we all want a friend like this, but it's a little bit more difficult to be a friend like this. And that's what I want to encourage us all to do, is to create that community where we go, man, we're just a, a big community of faith that's constantly looking up to one another and counting others more significant than we are. And then all of a sudden we go, hey, here's the deal. You may not have voted the way that I did. You may not see the world the way I see the world, but I'm still going to count you more significant than myself because I know that what we have in common is more important than the things that divide us. And the fact that we both need a savior and the fact that we both find ourselves in pain and we have the same anchor, may that be the thing that keeps us together and may I not be so caught up in my way and the way that I grew up and my ambitions and me, 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 me. May the dreams that the Lord has put in my heart be come to fruition because it's going to help so many other people. May I do the right thing for the right reason because I know it's going to benefit those around me. I think when we all do it together, that's where the magic happens. That's where we have that community where nobody can say, I'm looked down upon. Everybody gets to go, I'm looked up to because we have created a culture of everybody that serves. That's how I believe we could live in unity. Lord, I thank you so much for uh, the great opportunity we have to study your word. And Lord, I pray that you would illuminate even more for my friends that are gonna be studying this throughout the week. Lord, I pray that you would show us people in our life that we don't want to count as more significant than ourselves. And I pray, God, that in that moment you would give us the courage to do just that, that you would give us the courage to love that person right where they are. Lord, I pray that we would be able to practice this in our homes. Lord, would you give us the wisdom and the words to say when, when we feel like we're right and we assume that the other person is wrong? Lord, would you give us 30 seconds of humility long enough to pause, to listen to somebody else, to hear what they have to say? In Jesus' name I pray, everybody said, amen.